Hey everybody, Josh Roselle here. I'll be going over the primary hip section of the board review. We'll start with non-arthroplasty related topics such as anatomy and biomechanics, and then we'll move into primary hip. And having been pretty close to taking the written boards, we'll try to go over the highest yield topics as quickly as possible, and you'll have access to these slides. I also have a lot of review questions from the last 10 years uh, that, that I can get you as well. So let's uh, move right into it. So basic test taking strategy, you want to always read the last sentence of the question first. Just figure out what they're asking. A lot of these stems are going to be very long. So you want to build in some time to figure out what they're actually asking. Try to answer the question without looking at the choices first or try to get an idea. And then use the imaging to confirm whatever your answer choice might be. A lot of times they're going to give you a lot of superfluous information. So you really have to be able to weed out what's important and what's just fluff or red herrings. These are the most commonly tested topics in arthroplasty, especially related to the hip for the last 12 to 15 years. Um, we'll go over a lot of these in detail. So first, for surgical approaches, you want to know the muscular or internervous interval for each of the approaches. So for the anterior approach, your superficial interval between the sartorius and the tensor fascia innervated by the femoral nerve, your deep interval between the rectus and the glute medius supplied by the superior gluteal nerve. The most common uh, you know, injury after this approach is going to be your lateral femoral cutaneous nerve injury. They'll have neuralgia parasthetic over the anterolateral aspect of the thigh. Uh, it's easy to, it's an easy approach because it's supine. You get good stability and you can use fluoroscopy. Sometimes you have to use a special table and the femoral exposure can be difficult. Some people question the extensibility of this exposure compared to others. The anterolateral approach between the TFL and the glute medius is between, again, the superior gluteal nerve. This is an intervascular interval. And again, your supine, pretty much similar advantages to the anterior approach. It is an anteriorly based approach as well. The lateral or hardinge approach is an intermuscular interval between the fascial lobe and the glute medius. Um, you're basically at risk for the superior gluteal artery, five centimeters proximal to the tip of the greater troch, so you don't want to extend your incision that far proximally. Again, this uh, incision can be performed um, supine as well, but there's really no proximal extent because of that superior gluteal artery. Obviously, the downside is you're releasing the abductors and you need to repair them, so these patients can have Trendelenburg lurch. Historically, this has had the lowest risk of dislocation. The posterior approach, or the most extensile approach, is between the fascia lot and the gluteus maximus. You're splitting the gluteus maximus in its avascular plane. The gluteus maximus is supplied primarily by the inferior gluteal artery. Uh, again, it's the most extensile, but you do have to take down the external rotators and there is some questionable risk for stability, but in modern times, the risk of dislocation has been pretty low across the board as far as approaches are concerned. Here's the vascular anatomy of the proximal femur, and uh, you should just basically memorize the major branches, especially the um, common iliac, uh, the superficial femoral, and the deep profunda. The superficial femoral artery is what's going to be your major blood supply to the proximal thigh. Regarding hip radiography, the sacrococcygeal junction should be about 3 to 5 centimeters above the symphysis for a well-rotated view. You see the obturator foramina are nice and symmetric there. Obviously, you need to know your, <clears throat> your uh, lines of the pelvis, the teardrop Shenton's line, the uh, ilioischial and iliopectineal lines, as well as the anterior and posterior wall lines. For advanced imaging and total hip arthroplasty, we usually get Jude views for discontinuity or evaluation of the columns. A bone scan after hip arthroplasty, usually you have to wait about a year. Uh, you'll find uptake on these scans. They're, they're not really high yield uh, before that time. You typically, we're getting them for loosening. CT scans are useful for checking component positioning, evaluation of osteolysis, pre-op planning for custom triflanges, and then if there's a pre-op medial wall defect, you can see how close the vessels are if you get a CTA. Biomechanical concepts for hip arthroplasty. Um, basically, if the patient uses a cane, they need to use it in the opposite hand, which offsets the abductor force. If they're carrying groceries, they carry them in the ipsilateral side. Ultimately, the goal is to decrease the joint reactive forces. Some basic physics very quickly. There's a normal force, uh, your joint reactive force upward, and your abductor force and your body mass uh, pointed downward. These forces have torque, which gives them rotational component. You have A and B there, and the forces actually have to equal zero to provide for a stable hip. If you rearrange the math here, the ways to decrease your joint reactive forces are to decrease B or increase A, which means you uh, medialize the cup or you extend the offset. And those two things combined 
ultimately decrease your joint reactive forces. For patients who have uh, decreased offset or abductor insufficiency, they can get a Trendelenburg gait where the pelvis dips to the opposite side as they're walking. So as they're walking, if they let's say they have a Trendelenburg sign on the left, you'll see their pelvis dip down to the right side because the left-sided abductors cannot level the pelvis during single leg stance. With regard to AVN of the hip, you need to know that there's lack of blood flow to the femoral head. Risk factors include steroids, prednisone use, alcohol trauma, certain hemoglobinopathies, and uh, primarily the blood supply to the femoral head comes from the medial femoral circumflex artery in adults. Stages of AVN, you can either use the FECOT or the Steinberg classification. Both use x-ray uh, and MRI as well. Uh, I, typically, the Steinberg classification has been used. The most important point is uh, looking at stage 3 where you have subchondral collapse. Once you have subchondral collapse, any of the non-arthroplasty modalities are doomed to fail and you need to do total hip arthroplasty for these patients. The Steinberg classification is subcategorized into A, B, and C depending on the percentage of the femoral head involved on MRI. Again, if it's greater than 30% of the femoral head, you're looking at total hip arthroplasty. You can look at the Kerboul angle on an MRI. You use the mid-coronal plane and the mid-sagittal plane. You add up those numbers based on the angle of the necrotic area of the femoral head. If it's greater than 240 degree arc, then there's a high rate of collapse. If it's less than 190, it's a low rate of collapse. Treatment options for AVN. If there's pre-collapse and a reversible etiology, you can do a core decompression or vasculized fibular uh, bone graft. Uh, bisphosphonates can also be used, but they should be started before head collapse. This is the dosing for alendronate. Uh, in one study, 7% of the patients on alendronate got a THA versus 76% in a control group uh, that needed it. So bisphosphonates can be helpful, uh, but it, it, it is variable. I don't think they're going to test you on the use of bisphosphonates for AVN. The most important point, though, is to note that if there is collapse, then total hip arthroplasty is the treatment of choice. For developmental dysplasia of the hip, you see certain acetabular changes such as anterolateral uncoverage. You see an oblique sore seal, a small socket, and a deep cotyloid fossa. On the femoral side, you'll see a small valgus canal uh, with excessive aniversion and posteriorization of the greater trochanter. So when planning for these preoperatively, a lot of times you're using modular stems or um, Wagner cones where you can adjust the um, antiversion of the stem to accommodate the patient's anatomy. Radiographic parameters for DDH, you're looking at the lateral center edge angle. It's a little counterintuitive because you're looking at an AP radiograph, but it is, on this view, it's the lateral center edge. If you're looking at a lateral view of the hip, it's an anterior center edge angle. If it's less than 20 degrees, that's considered dysplastic. If the acetabular index is greater than 25 degrees, that's also considered dysplastic as well. So those are two signs you can tell for acetabular dysplasia. There's the Crow classification that basically looks at the femoral head subluxation as well as the proximal femoral displacement. Crow 4 is obviously the worst, and you're going to see the, the hip riding way up high. The femoral head is going to be in a pseudoacetabulum in the ilium, and this has implications when you're doing total hip arthroplasty for these patients to be able to bring down that hip center um, and lengthen the leg, so we'll talk about that later. Treatment of DDH. Um, early on, you can do a PAO or a Gons or Bernese osteotomy, it's called. The advantages of this is that the joints medialize, you leave the posterior column intact. You make three separate uh, cuts in the ilium, ischium, and pubis. It allows for early weight bearing. Uh, you just want to avoid overcorrection here. Here's a, an image of the uh, pelvis where you're making those three cuts around the, uh, the, pubis to re the, the pelvis to reorient the acetabulum. Again, you see that the posterior column is left intact. We talked about lengthening the leg in DDH cases. If the preoperative image shows that the femoral head is above the lesser trochanter, typically you're going to have to do a sub, uh, subtrochanteric osteotomy to, to remove a segment of the femur to shorten the actual thigh bone so that you're not stretching the sciatic nerve, uh, specifically the perineal division of the sciatic nerve when you uh, do the hip arthroplasty. This is fixed after you do the hip arthroplasty, typically with um, the bone that you removed and some cables. Femoral acetabular impingement. You can either see cam or pincer for impingement. This is uh, acetabular uh, impingement on the, pin uh, on the acetabular side, the pincer deformity. 
Again, I said active middle-aged females. Typical signs, you'll, you may see some ischial spine sign, which indicates acetabular retroversion. You could also see crossover sign or a deep acetabular socket, which is indicative of acetabular retroversion. Treatment for femoral acetabular impingement is, can be arthroscopy. It can also be non-operative treatment. Uh, typically, labral repair can be done, and it's better than debridement for these patients. There's also osteochondroplasty to remove the bump on the, on the femoral head neck junction. You could also do surgical neck dislocation uh, as well, or, or you know, surgical dislocation in general. Um, they're not, they may not test you too much on surgical dislocation, uh, but just know that these are the options for treatment of FAI. But predominantly, your treatment is going to be non-operative physical therapy, things like that. Okay, we'll move into the primary hip section. Here's a standard AP radiograph, low pelvis of the hip. You want to, again, assess for the rotation. You want to look at leg lengths. You want to look at offset. Uh, when you're looking at pre-op planning and templating. For templating the cup, you want to medialize to the teardrop. You want to make sure the abduction angle is about 40 to 45 degrees. You want to make sure the base of the cup is at the base of the teardrop, and you're not taking a whole lot of uh, bone. You're just really removing the subchondral bone there. Typically, the head of the, the, the center of the rotation of the cup should line up generally with the center of rotation of the femoral head. And again, you'll notice differences when you're templating as to if you're going to be lengthening or providing them with more or less offset. If there's more than 50 degrees of abduction, you're at risk for edge loading in eccentric polywear. You'll actually, if you look at the thickness of the poly on the top and bottom portions of the head, you'll see that they're disproportionate and that can give you a clue as to early polywear. This is how you judge version of the cup on the cross table lateral x-ray. Um, if there's too much acetabular retroversion, you can get psoas impingement where, where the cup is uh, basically abrading the psoas tendon. Here, when you're looking at offset, you measure from the center of the femoral head to the center of the trochanter. You can also look at global offset from the ischium to the lesser trochanter. Um, they'll give you some questions potentially about, uh, they'll put the template on the on the hip and they'll tell you, you know, is the, are you lengthening? Are you giving more offset based on the center of rotation of the hip and the center of rotation of the, of the native femur? Uh, basically, wherever the templated hip is being reduced into the acetabular socket, that's what you're going to be, that's where you're moving the leg. So if you're, if the center of rotation is moving upward, then it means you're shortening the leg and vice versa. If the center of rotation is moving laterally, then you're giving them more offset versus not. So just know those diagrams. I'm sure you've all seen those questions before. Or with regard to proximal femoral anatomy, you look at the door classification. A is the champagne flute. B is sort of the standard femur. And C is this uh, very capacious canal typical for uh, cementing total hip arthroplasties. Ideal component positioning, there's really no safe zone anymore that we know of. Originally it was described by Lewinick and it was about 40 degrees of antiversion plus or minus 10 and 15 degrees of antiversion plus or minus 10. For anterior based approaches your antiversion is going to be probably a little bit closer to 15. For posterior approaches it's going to be closer to 25 given the risk of posterior dislocation. You're referencing your trans your, uh, acetabular ligament or transverse acetabular ligament uh, to, to judge your version intraoperatively. Abduction is typically about 35 to 45 degrees. We talked about edge loading. Ideal component positioning for the femur, you want to match their anatomic version based on the calcar. Typically, this is about 12 to 15 degrees of antiversion. Ways to change the antiversion, you can use a modular stem. You can use an SROM stem where you're uh, building an antiversion that way. You can cement and put the femur in whatever antiversion you want. But the combined antiversion should be about 35 to 50 degrees. If you're less than that, you're at risk for posterior instability because everything is retroverted. If you're greater than that, you're at risk for anterior instability because everything is antiverted slightly more. The basic hip-spine relationship, uh, anytime you have a t less than 10 degree change in sacral slope from sitting to standing or standing to sitting, you, that describes the, hip, the lumbar spine as being stiff. Stuck standing, you're going to there's basically two flavors. There's stuck standing where you have a more lordotic spine. The pelvis can't roll back when you're sitting, so you're at risk for anterior impingement. The femurs will bang up against the cups, and you're at risk for posterior dislocation. So for those types of patients, you know, those who are fused to the pelvis, uh, you want to build in a little bit more antiversion to the cup. The other flavor is stuck sitting where you have a flat back deformity, and you're at risk for anterior dislocation, so you tend to build a little bit more retroversion into the cup for those. Regarding head-neck ratio, this is a way to decrease your impingement. The larger the head and the um, increase the excursion distance, the less risk you are for um, 
impingement. You want to maximize the head-neck ratio. With larger heads, you can see that there's greater uh, range of motion before impingement. The only risk for larger heads on smaller trunnions is that you're at risk for uh, taper corrosion because of the large cantilever bending forces. Here you can see different neck lengths uh, depending on the size of the um, matching between the taper and the head. The more neck length you give, plus 3.5, plus 10.5, you're going to give them more offset and more length. You would want to try to avoid skirts if possible because that increases the forces and can also increase the impingement as well. Here are three images with larger, progressively larger heads. You can see that there's more range of motion prior to impingement of the neck on the cup with a larger head. Polyethylene thickness, this number varies, but traditionally it's you, you want to have a, at least five millimeters of thickness of poly. Um, the femoral head size plus the poly thickness is going to give you the outer, the acetabular shell inner diameter. So you want to have a uniform thickness around about five millimeters to prevent early poly wear. Different acetabular liners you can use. Typically you use neutral or elevated lip liners. The elevated lip liners give you about 20 degrees uh, extra before uh, dislocation. Lateralized liners can be used to increase offset and face changing liners can be used to change version. Constrained liners typically are used for abductor insufficiency uh, or very, very failed salvage cases. The components must be properly positioned and typically this requires an ingrown cup because there's so much force on the cup that if you put a constrained liner in a non-ingrown cup it's going to rip the whole cup out. Dual mobility is gaining popularity for uh, revision cases in certain primaries such as a stiff spine where you feel like the patient needs increased range of motion prior to impingement. Um, there's disc decreased dislocation and reoperation rate in dual mobility compared to large femoral heads. They're also more cost effective. Many of these still have metal on metal interfaces if they're modular between the cup and the metal acetabular liner uh, so that there is still a risk of metal on metal uh, ions. You don't really see it too much. There's also a risk of intraprosthetic dislocation between the small and the larger head. This risk is pretty low, but it does exist. Acetabular screw placement and total hip arthroplasty. You want to stay in your safe zone, which is your posterior superior zone. Uh, the zones are made by making a line from the ASIS through the center of the cup and then a line perpendicular to that. So basically, if your screws are between the A, the uh, anterior acetabular iliac spine, uh, sorry, anterior superior iliac spine and the posterior superior iliac spine, then you are pretty safe. For revision scenarios, you basically want to put screws wherever you can get fixation. And you should know the uh, the dangers for the anterior superior zone and the anterior inferior zone seen there. Stress shielding, major determinant of stem stiffness uh, to a factor of four. There's different modulus mismatches between the bone and the stem, so if you're using a cobalt chrome stem or um, something like that where there's a mismatch between the modulus of elasticity between the stem and the bone, you're going to be at risk for stress shielding. The ideal scenario for development of stress shielding, you have a large diameter round diaphyseal fitting stem, so typically now stems are titanium to increase the um, or, or to decrease stress shielding because it's more similar to bone. We'll go over the chart uh, a little bit later. For metaphyseal stems, you don't really see a lot of stress shielding because the load concentrations in the metaphysis and the proximal diaphysis, so you maintain that bone density. There's different types of femoral stems. With regard to cementless stems, you have metaphyseal fitting and diaphyseal fitting, and there's also cemented stems. The cementless stems, you have the flat wedge taper, metaphyseal fitting stems. Uh, there's dual taper stems like the fit and fill stems that are more typical for uh, type A uh, femoral canals. They're also more fit and filling proximally, so it gives you a little bit more stability. There's also proximal modular stems like the SROM that we talked about can be used for uh, DDH type cases. The diaphyseal stems are, can be extensively porous coated like the AML. It can be tapered uh, monoblock stems like the Wagner or the Redapt stem. Uh, the other flavor of the um, revision style stems are the modular tapered stems where you pop the stem distally and you can add a modular stem and judge your, change your version that way. Uh, these stems do have increased proximal stress shielding because they do have the fit in the diaphyseal region. Uh, the, the pitfall for these is that people tend to undersize these in order to avoid fracture, but then you get uh, poor ingrowth. For cemented stems, they're typically the polished, smooth, tapered stems like the Exeter. They're easy to remove. You can tap in, tap out. Um, if you if the stem is not infected and you have to revise it and the patient's high morbidity, you can leave the cement mantle in place and just cement into the cement mantle. 
Uh, there's decreased fracture risk, about a 10 times decreased fracture risk with cementing a stem compared to cementless. There is increased fat embolization risk, so you want to avoid, um, you, you want to make sure you tell anesthesia that you're going to be cementing. Uh, typically patients with renal disease, this is a great, uh, a great way to get the stem in because they have decreased calcium phosphate uh, product ratios. Patients with heart or lung disease can be a little bit more challenging and they have higher risk for uh, pulmonary complications. For cemented stems, you want to have about a two centimeter, two millimeter cement mantle. You don't want to be, you don't want to put these in varus because there's higher cantilever forces on it. Um, the cement is interdigitating with the cancellous bones, so you're using impaction style brooches, and uh, the cement is strongest in compression. Cement technique, we're all using now third generation technique with vacuum packing, uh, pressurization, canal preparation, pulse lavage. If you're doing infection cases, it doesn't matter what kind of cement technique you're using for the, for prostolac or for the acetabular side because you're going to be taking out the, uh, the components anyway. In order to tell if the cemented stem is loose, there's four things you can look at. You can look at fracture of the actual stem. You can look at radiolucent lines between the stem and the mantle. You can look at subsidence, or you can look at cement mantle fracture. These are the Gruen zones one through seven to describe uh, uh, femoral stem loosening. Whether or not you use a cementless or cemented stem, um, the press fit style stems are gonna have either ingrowth or ongrowth. For ingrowth, you want the pore size to be about 50 to 400 micrometers. The pore depth is most important. For ongrowth, the surface roughness is most important. These are typically your group blasted or, or plasma sprayed stems. Um, the roughness is basically the distance from the peak to the trough of the pits. And um, it's in, just important to know that there's two types of uh, ingrowth, or two types of uh, press fit principles, either ingrowth or ongrowth. Just know the pore size and surface roughness for ongrowth, and you'll probably be fine. Uh, cementless fixation requires initial uh, rigid fixation with less than 150 micrometers of motion. Uh, if you have uh, more motion than that, you can get fibrous encapsulation or failure to ingrow. Uh, you need to have cortical uh, contact, and you don't want to undersize the stem for risk of subsidence. Um, the bone expands around the prosthesis as you're impacting it. The hoop stresses are generated and then are eventually mitigated. Um, the complication for press fit stems are fracture. Uh, so you have to be careful when you're in, when you're putting in these stems. You can do line to line fixation. Um, the bone prepared is the same size as the implant, uh, and again, um, there's scratch fit, you know, extensive for extensively porous coated stems, and you can supplement with screws. Special cases uh, of total hips for ankylosing spondylitis. These are just the buzz terms. Bamboo spine, they lose their lumbar lordosis, so they have a fixed lumbar spine. Typically, these patients have increased antiversion, so they're at risk for anterior instability, anterior dislocation. Uh, you can do post-operative heterotopic ossification prophylaxis with either um, radiation or six weeks of indocin. The radiation is, uh, you can either do it before surgery or up to three days after surgery, one dose uh, between six and 800 centigrade of radiation. Parkinson's disease, you worry about instability, so those cases are more likely to use dual mobility cups. Sickle cell disease, you can worry about early loosening. These patients also have uh, typically very sclerotic femurs, so femoral preparation is challenging. Psoriatic arthritis, you worry about infection as, long as, as well as any other rheumatologic disease where they're either on prednisone or DMARDs. Dialysis patients, uh, again, very, very high risk for infection. Kidney, kidney disease gives you the highest risk of infection and uh, radiation necrosis after um, cancer treatment uh, is t now the only indication for a uh, cemented cup. For displaced femoral neck fractures, they're more common in the elderly, females greater than males. Uh, the displaced ones are types 3 and 4 garden classification, and these are the ones where you're considering uh, hemi versus total arthroplasty. These patients have about a 20 to 30 percent mortality rate within the first year, and failure is very, very high if you don't do an arthroplasty type procedure for these patients. Hemiarthroplasty is for the frail dependent people with poor mental status or function. Uh, the unipolar is more effective than a bipolar hemiarthroplasty. Typically for these patients you're going to be cementing these stems. Uh, there's lower risk of dislocation because you're using a larger head than you would be in a total hip. Um, for the younger active uh, people you're going to be doing a total hip arthroplasty especially with patients who have pre-existing hip arthritis. There's better functional outcomes with total hip arthroplasty. Again, the buzzwords are going to be if they're young, healthy, active, you're going to be doing a total hip arthroplasty. You can use a larger femoral head. You can consider using dual mobility to mitigate the chance of dislocation, but 
Um, that's a dealer's choice. Bearing surfaces, you have hard on hard and hard on soft, ceramic on ceramic, metal on metal, and then ceramic or metal on poly. This is the Young's modulus chart. You should just memorize this. Ceramic has the highest Young's modulus. Um, titanium is pretty close to cortical bone, so that's why the femoral stems are made of titanium. Uh, cobalt chrome is uh, a harder, uh, harder material and more distant from cortical bone, so that's where you get your stress shielding from. Ceramic on ceramic typically reserved for younger patients that has the lowest wear profile. Ceramic fracture is rare. Ceramic head fracture about 1 in 10,000. Uh, you can have stripe wear, and that's due to micro-separation of the head from the socket. Uh, squeaking is about occurs about 1% of patients and can be significant. There's different types of ceramic now where pretty much everybody's using the alumina ceramic. It's inert, it's brittle, has a very low fracture risk. The original zirconia ceramics had a triphasic uh, crystal structure with high failure rate because of, its mono, because of its phase transformation in vivo from the tetragonal phase to the monoclinical phase. Um, that's why you see you saw more wear, you saw more fractures with the zirconia, so now the alumina is used. 2019-2020, uh, this is arguably the best combination ceramic on poly. With our highly crosslinked poly and ceramic heads, there's virtually no wear even at about 15 years. So it, I, if this was my hip, I would, I would opt for ceramic on poly. Uh, the metal on metal is not done a whole lot anymore, obviously, due to metal ions. Um, typically, it was reserved for younger active males, laborers, um, we'll talk about lubrication uh, for hard-on-hard -hard surfaces a little bit later. The original reason why these were introduced was because of large femoral heads and low volumetric wear. Metal-on-metal -metal can also be used for resurfacing. Again, these, this is reserved for uh, younger, very active males. Um, you have a large femoral head, so you decrease the risk of dislocation. You're avoiding femoral resection, uh, potentially for uh, conversion to total hip arthroplasty in the future. Uh, component positioning is extremely important in these cases. You want to uh, make sure that you have um, good positioning to avoid abduction, high abduction, high antiversion, and subsequent edge loading. There's also a risk for femoral neck fracture. That's sort of the buzzword for, for these types of patients. Uh, contraindications, uh, basically anything out of the ordinary, you know, osteoporosis, AVN, neck shaft angle less than 120 because that increases the, the forces of the, of the components. Uh, very short neck, um, a lot of deformity, leg length discrepancy, things like that. Metal on poly has a long track record, typically used for lower demand patients. It's a little bit cheaper than using a ceramic head option, uh, but you still can get taper corrosion. And when you have metal on metal ion levels that are uh, significantly higher cobalt than chromium, that's typically a taper issue. If the metal ion levels are uh, elevated but equivalent, that's typically an articular issue. So the wear profile, ceramic on ceramic is the best, uh, followed by metal on metal, then ceramic on poly and metal on poly. There's different mechanisms of wear. Adhesive, abrasive, fatigue, third body, and corrosive. Adhesive wear is basically uh, where the polyethylene gets debonded from the, from the surface of the polyethylene because it gets stuck to the prosthesis and gets pulled off. This is the most important mechanism in osteolysis. Uh, abrasive wear is the cheese grater effect due to the differences in the material hardness where the softer material gets abraded away um, from the harder material asperities. Fatigue wear is just local stresses that exceed the fatigue strength of the material. You see subsurface delamination, you see cracks, and this also releases polyethylene particles. Corrosive wear is a form of third body wear. Um, that's not really um, actively tested too much. There's different types of corrosion. Uh, you should know that galvanic corrosion occurs between two dissimilar metals. So if you're putting a different type of metal on a uh, different type of trunnion type metal, then you'll see a lot of corrosion there. Fretting corrosion is micromotion between two surfaces. So you see that in modular stems at the actual taper junction can cause uh, uh, fatigue, failure, and fracture of the actual stem. Crevice corrosion is due to differences in oxygen tension where the passivization layer is disrupted. So again, these are just, you know, for crevice corrosion, you want to think oxygen tension. Galvanic, you want to think two different metals. And fretting corrosion, you want to think micromotion. There's different modes of wear. So there's types of wear, and then there's modes of wear. Modes of wear uh, can involve intended surfaces or unintended surfaces. The only intended surface is the articular surface. Everything else is unintended, either the surface with a secondary surface, third body wear, or junction wear. So again, mode one is between intended surfaces like the femoral head and the liner. 
Mode 2 is like between the femoral head and the shell, or the femoral component backing a, of a patella. Mode 3 is third body wear, so polyethylene debris. And mode 4 is between two unintended secondary surfaces, such as backside wear underneath the polyethylene tray of a knee, or fretting between a trunnion and a cone of a uh, or THA or TKA. The effective joint space is basically where any particles can get to, uh, where osteolysis can eventually form. This is very important. They'll 100% ask a question somewhat related to osteolysis. Uh, you need to know that the polyethylene particles are the wear generators and that the rank ligand is produced by the osteoblast. The rank ligand links up with rank on the osteoclast and then leads to bone resorption. So osteolysis is really uh, mediated by the osteoclast activation by the osteoblast. Osteoprotegrin protects against osteolysis by binding to rank L, so it cannot bind to rank. So just memorize this picture and just know that rank ligand is produced by osteoblasts, and that's what gets the whole process started. You can see endosteal scalloping on this femoral uh, x-ray here, and that's indicative of osteolysis. When do you operate on it? Severe eccentric polywear. Uh, if the head wears through the liner, if you have loose mouth position components or periprosthetic fracture. But the goal is to remove the wear generator, which is typically the liner. Uh, but nowadays with the highly crosslinked poly, we're really not seeing osteolysis much anymore at all. There's different types of poly wear. It's is volumetric wear, which is uh, dependent on the size of the femoral head related to R squared. So the larger the femoral head, the more volumetric wear you're going to have. Volumetric wear determines the number of particles created. Linear wear is the distance the actual head migrates into the liner or penetrates the liner. If there's greater than 0.1 millimeters per year, that's associated with osteolysis and more wear. Again, increased head size, you're going to have uh, increased volumetric wear. If you have decreased head size, you're going to have increased linear wear. Comparing hips versus knees, uh, smaller particles in the hips but larger volume. Factors that affect polywear, uh, and this will be related to knees as well, but uh, it is important nonetheless. Polyethylene manufacturing and sterilizing, irradiation, shelf life, surface roughness, and the sphericity of the head. Most importantly, though, we'll talk about manufacturing and sterilizing. So what you should know here is that direct compression molding uh, yields the best wear rate. There's other ways uh, of molding, such as ram bar, sheet molding, uh, but direct compression molding is the best. PE sterilization, you can do it in gas, plasma spray, or low-dose radiation. Um, for uh, ethylene gas and gas plasma, there's no cross-link. It's a very long process, and you have to do surface sterilization as well. Irradiation uh, ruptures the polyethylene bonds, and you want to make sure that this is done uh, without the presence of oxygen. If there is oxygen presence, you're going to get chain scission and free radicals forming. Uh, if oxygen is absent, this is where you get the cross-linking and the strength of the polyethylene. So low-dose radiation in uh, an inert environment is the best uh, for polyethylene wear. Uh, High-dose radiation, you have more free radicals that are formed, and then the polyethylene can be modified either by annealing it, which is um, heating it to just below melting temperature, or melting it, uh, which is above melting temperature. Uh, the difference between the two is that when you anneal something, you have more remaining free radicals but better mechanical strength because you're not heating it up as much. Melting, you have less free radicals but also less mechanical strength, so there's a trade-off between the two. Crystallinity, uh, polyethylene exists in two forms. There's the amorphous form, which is where the cross-linking actually happens, and then there's the crystalline form that provides the mechanical strength. We talked about melting increases the temperature, decreases the rate of recrystallization, so it decreases the mechanical properties. Annealed uh, polyethylene has better crystallinity and strength and higher potential for oxidation and osteolysis because there's more free radicals. Different ways to quench the free radicals. Uh, vitamin E polys have been used. There's been sequential processing now where you do this whole process multiple times, irradiate, anneal, and repeat it, and then mechanical compression as well. Highly cross-linked poly, you should know that it has a decreased Young's modulus, decreased tensile strength, decreased fatigue strength, and decreased fracture toughness, um, but very, very low wear rates. PE shelf life, again, the worst case scenario is gamma radiation in air. You want to have something that uh, has a low shelf life and then is uh, in it, manufactured in an inert environment without oxygen present. Bearing lubrication, again, pretty low yield, but they could still ask you about it. The big things are that uh, for hard-on-hard -hard, uh, bearing lubrication, like metal-on-metal -metal or ceramic-on-ceramic, -ceramic, you have both boundary and elastohydrodynamic. 
uh, lubrication. For hard on soft, you only have boundary lubrication where the synovial fluid is the lubricant and there's just enough synovial fluid to separate the uh, two uh, bearing surfaces. For hip arthrodesis, uh, the indications for this are young patient, very severe arthritis. Typically, it's a laborer. Typically, any joint that you think about fusing is for young laborers. So look at that. Look for that in the STEM question. Um, typically, you know, these patients can have autofusion and rheumatoid arthritis, but they're post-septic or post-traumatic arthritis. Um, there's a 30% increased energy expenditure for patients who have hip arthrodesis, and the number one reason for fusion takedowns and total hip arthroplasty is low back pain. And lastly, uh, the fusion position, slight flexion, neutral abduction, and uh, just slight external rotation. So in general, um, that's the section for the primary hip, and I have a bunch of questions uh, from the last uh, 10 to 15 years that I can uh, give you guys. The most important advice I can give you for the boards is just do it, as many questions as you can. Understand why the answer choices that they're giving you are either correct or incorrect and how you can reformat the question to make each of those, ans each of those answer choices correct. The difference between the boards and the OIT is that the boards is going to have more highly vetted questions. So these are really going to have only one correct answer. Uh, they're going to be not that vague, and they're just going to be long question sims. So really, this test is about stamina. Uh, you know the information. It's just about uh, staying strong and, and, and sticking with it. So good luck, everybody. I'm happy to talk about any other topics um, offline.